Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. I'm Sal LaFrieri, and I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Jim Henry. And today, we're going to be talking about design considerations for the workplace. We're talking about tactical approaches to security and those security postures that need to change because of this psychological dynamic that's affecting today's workforce. You know, what might once be been considered smoke and mirrors is now becoming a reality in our world. Right? We have to take into account people's feelings and how they, how they are concerned about it. And so we've seen it in a limited fashion, but uh, you know, today we're starting to see that it's becoming more of, more of a reality. And obviously, today's architects are considering issues and opinions that security would have never dreamed of. So, Jim, the psychological impacts to security... I, I'm, I'm almost at a loss for security with us, especially with terrorism and everything going on today. You kind of think about, okay, what, what's the real hard things that we need to worry about and be concerned with? Worrying about somebody's feelings sometimes would always take a, a backseat to it. So you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, but what are you saying? What, what's I, your I, I have never seen a situation or a time where Smoke and mirrors had such value <laughs> because, I mean, a week doesn't go by where the supposed medical experts don't contradict whatever they said the week before. It's, you know, it's sad, but it's, you know, it's almost comical. But, you know, I, one of the old uh, cliches that, I, that I've uh, leaned on over the years is, you know, perception is reality. And right now, perception is chaos. So the you know, addressing the the psychological comfort level of people to come back into the workplace, I think now is is the most effective thing that we can actually do. And some things may have very superficial value, if not if not no value at all. But whatever we can do to get people to follow, you know, the macro guidelines and to feel comfortable in doing it, you know, without, uh, you know, going off the reservation <laughs> is, I think, very, very wise. And it's, you know, the, all systems, all procedures, all rules are only good if people believe in them and, uh, and believe that they're following them for good reason. So I really do think that this um, foundation of, uh, of a mindset here, when you're looking at, you know, the you know, designing, you know, solutions and whatnot that are, uh, that are aimed at that are, uh, you know, is, is all we can do at this point. You know, we had talked about on earlier shows about the, how, you know, we're taking security and we're moving into the, the, the new realm of health and safety, right? Where, you know, traditionally in the security world, health and safety included, you know, trip and falls. So if there was something that posed the risk, if there was a trip and fall or something that somebody can get hurt, we were concerned about that. We were concerned with the health and safety aspect where you needed an ambulance. Somebody got sick in the building and you had to bring an ambulance in. How do we get them in and expedite them in and expedite the patient out quickly? Today, we're looking at you know temperature sensing and we're looking at medical conditions. And you know the, the, so there, there's the adjustment that has to be made. But then we get into the whole psychological issue and trying to think about how are people actually feeling and it's something that it's, I guess, you know, for the most part, I mean, we're just, you know, that, that would fall more under the HR side of it than it would the security side. But we're, we're seeing it and it's seeing that it's something that we need to, you know, that we need to deal with. So today's guest is sort of perfectly suited for this conversation. Uh, today we have with us May Fon is a multidisciplinary design strategist who works with renowned global architectural firms on international and domestic retail, exhibition, hospitality, and workplace environments. As a principal strategist of MF Architecture and Design Innovation, she develops intuitive spaces and people experiences that transform organizations from the inside out. May, welcome to the show, and you are probably the best qualified person to be talking to us about this because clearly you got two old dogs here who just don't understand the new tricks. <laughs> Hi, Sal. Hi, Jim. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So what I want to do is, you know, we were trying to think about the best way to approach it. And so we thought about maybe we'll start out just with the tactical approaches. And 
it probably would be best for us at least to you know kind of think about it and you know in the way we think about these things so you know let let's talk first up about tactical and you know in pre-production we had talked to you about it and one of the things that really stood out with us was you know there's the tactical approach and then there's a the psychological so let's start with the tactical and let's talk about the breakdown between the different approaches to design, okay? So let's start with tactical. Let's talk about space requirements. What are those things from the tactical level? Again, not psychological, but tactical level. Talk to us about space requirements and what you're seeing both with regulations and what have you. So right now what we're looking at in terms of returning to the communal space, uh, specifically for office spaces, is really, you know, the social distancing part. And how do you implement something like that when the office space really was about coming together um, and convening? So what we're seeing clients asking for and what we're actually implementing is, first of all, your moving desks and your spacing them out and places where people used to used to meet the, you know, the breakout rooms, the conference rooms, um, even in the lobby, is that we're taking extreme measures to make sure that we are not encouraging people to to gather and to not um, be able to have that six feet distancing. So first of all, it's just moving furniture and moving chairs and even, you know, taping out and giving visual cues through graphics and uh, posters to communicate the new way of moving through the space. And a lot of this is, you know, putting out FAQs for people to understand what is the new uh, health and safety etiquette when they do come back to a public space. Now, those, those, FAQ, uh, those FAQs yeah. are basically being driven by what the states or, or what the what government agencies are dictating. Yeah. So, you know, for licensed architects, we really do have to follow building codes. And, you know, there's a lot of there, you know, it's really life safety that we're looking after. And, you know, first and foremost, we have to follow the city and state guidelines. And the city and state really do look at the CDC as the, the, you know, base standard of how to keep people safe in um, a public space so we're looking at, you know, CDC guidelines and following state and federal very carefully. Mm-hmm. Building codes are also following suit as well. So, you know, there's that part. And then a lot of it is really using common sense. So, May, uh, modifying existing structures to accommodate these guidelines is is one thing because it's not, you know, making very... Um, permanent necessarily, you know, changes to uh, to the physical structure. But for new designs that you see in the queue, are you getting, I mean, in, you know, pre, uh, pre-January, building developers, you know, were doing everything that they possibly could to get to maximize leasable space. And, you know, the rush, I, I, I look at the rush to the, um, you know, to the destination dispatch of elevators, you know, that came to integrate that with, um, you know, with access control to minimize the number of, uh, of elevators necessary for a given square footage. And again, it was all aimed at maximize lease space, get everybody, you know, in as close, make use of every square foot that you got. So when we're now designing, you know, around COVID guidelines, you know, it's almost a polar opposite to that. Right. So when, when you're looking at new construction, is it actually going to push into uh, the impact of reversing that trend with the number of elevators that are provided for lease space? Because that's a big, big, big change. Right. That, that's a great question. Um, what we're seeing right now is Clients are, they're hesitant to make any kind of structural decisions right now that is going to cost a lot up front without knowing, you know, there's two timelines that we're looking at right now. There's the pre-vaccine and then the post-vaccine. So spending all this capital 
on structural decisions that may not make sense post-vaccine, I think clients are hesitant about that. But I think non-structural decisions can be made and through the use of technology, we're able to to respond to you know the current health crisis and what i mean by that is from a building mechanical system is you know buildings in the last two decades have been like you said it's all about densifying and putting as many people into a space as possible and even for mechanical system building elevators about moving as many people as quickly as possible. And now we're looking at the pendulum swinging the completely opposite way. But, you know, I I think a lot of the smarter decisions right now is not making those structural decisions, but instead using smart technologies. So putting in, um, you know, giving employees coming into buildings badges that when they go through a turnstile, they know what floor they need to go on. And, And then even putting in you know, human capital. So having a concierge there to, you know, to, to make sure that there's not as many people going into no more than two to four at once into an elevator car. Um, So using both low tech and high tech ways to respond to current situation. You know, I think that's really what we're seeing the most happening. I think one investment that might make, um, both tactical and psychological sense uh, are investments in more more advanced HVAC systems because we mm-hmm. saw you know right after nine eleven and we had the scare for you know chembio you know terrorist attacks and whatnot that brought into light you know you know where are the air filtration systems coming into buildings you know are they exposed to a terrorist you know injecting you know some chemicals or powders or whatnot into that. And although the practical reality is, you know, that that overall HVAC systems can only do so much when it comes to mm-hmm. COVID. If somebody that's, you know, within six feet of you is sick, then even if you have the most sophisticated, you know, system in the world, it's not going to protect you from that kind of proximity. But it does have uh, some, I think, some psychological benefit to, to promote you know, to your tenancy or what have you, the right. the level of sophistication of those HVAC systems. I think that's pretty much what the airlines are trying to do now with the filtration systems that they have on board planes to have people feel more at ease, you know, being in that closed environment. So, you know, uh, you know, might that be where the, you know, the, the first steps that, that they're going to take again for, for that dual purpose of both tactical and psychological? Yes, and absolutely right. On both ends, there's from the tactical side is business owners and and employers have to put in the the actual appliances into the HVAC system and really understanding and knowing that there's transparency there, that they're putting in HEPA filters and MRF 13s to make sure that there's air being uh, ventilated, that, you know, that the amount of ventilation in the space and out of filtration to supply the airstream are really being looked after and taken seriously. So, you know, all of that, whether it's putting in appliances, UV, UV lighting, all of that is only one part of the solution. The other part is communicating that to your patrons, to to the the users in the space, so that they do have that sense of uh, trust and building that sense of trust is really what we need right now. So seeing that things are being put in place, but also communicating what is being done is um, you know really the two parts of of what's happening and, and part of the solution. Well, I think that's going to be a great setup for part two of this, where we want to talk about some of the psychological concepts and what uh, some of the things that that you're working on today uh, that sort of fits into that that realm, that arena. But before we do that, I just want to remind everyone that you're listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and me, Sal LaFreary. We're going to invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. If you're interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, we're going to ask you to please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com and set that up. 
So let's get into the psychological concepts. I I guess the best place to start, what issues are you seeing today that pertain to the psychological issues? Uh, You know, what what are those things that you know, from a, from a design side of it, I mean, obviously you want to look at usability, but today, you know, you would, you would mention to us that the psychology of the person utilizing the space is as critical as the functionality. So talk to us a little bit about the psychological concepts that you're actually looking at and pertain, that pertain to this today. Yeah. So what we're looking at today is something that architects and designers building environments for the public space and even in private spaces have been pushing for a very long time is really understanding the users and what their needs are and going from there, working backwards. So undergoing a deep dive of discovery sessions before you even get into the design uh, and conceptual process. Because at the end of the day, There is no one-size-fits-all design, and every organization is different. Every organization has different ways of working, you know, different culture and behaviors that happen in different workflows. So as a design strategist, I come in before we start a project, we start designing and really sit down and go through um, interviewing and discovery, visioning sessions to really find out who the users are. And from there, that's where you get a a really good understanding and appreciation of what their needs are. And that translates to responding to their psychological needs in addition to physical needs. Um, And right now in this current health crisis we're in, psychological safety is equally important to getting people safely back into a public space. Why is that? It's, you know, we're dealing with an invisible enemy and there is no way to really understand, you know, like you said earlier, guidelines change every day and new scientific research comes out every day. We have to use, you know, we have to really use logic, but also common sense And part of common sense is really knowing that people are going to make psychological decisions. And right now, there's a really wide spectrum of a sense of readiness. So as an employer or even a business owner, you really have to address those psychological needs. And by doing that, send out a pulse survey, you know, interview the users, understand and really have come in from a perspective of empathy and understand that everybody is going through this in a different way. Someone might look at a bottle of hand sanitizer and be reminded that a loved one has passed because of COVID, while somebody else might be completely oblivious to it. So I think we're really, we, there's a wide spectrum right now. And, you know, that's the reason why there is no one size fits all design. You know, the architectural, elements have to really touch on the emotional aspect and get people to feel safe by communicating what building owners are doing, what business owners and leaders are doing to make sure that their employees and their patrons can come into a space that is safe and that their health um, and well-being is utmost importance to them. That's the only way you could build trust right now and rebuild that trust that we've lost. So may I'm I'm also again correlating you know what we're going through now to some of the uh, steps that were taken post 9/11 and uh, particularly in New York after 9/11 um, a building code called local law 26 was enacted for uh, the design of of exit stairwells and uh, for messaging uh, in those stairwells uh, particularly in buildings that had uh, you know, let's say a north and a south stairwell that then opened up to four stairwells going down to the four corners of the building. And, uh, you know, decisions uh, that people evacuating the building had to make as to, you know, which which one of those stairwells that they were going to take. And uh, one of the things that we saw, you know, come into play was stairwell signage. And the stairwell signage was there not only for the 
tactical reason of, of making sure that people went down the right stairwell that didn't necessarily have a, uh, you know, any kind of obstructions or blockage to it because, you know, the lessons learned from, from 9-11 is some people went down a stairwell to try and get out to the street and there mm-hmm. was debris there and then they'd have to go back up. And of course, when they go back up, they're panicking because they don't know they're going up in a building that's in stress. And, uh, you know, the department is trying to do is to, is to eliminate that uncertainty and that chaos so that if there is a procedure that's being followed, depending on what the situation is, you know, that, that people are staying calm. And the more information that's presented to them, you know, in the way of, um, you know, of, of real-time signage that is clearly, you know, uh, you know addressing whatever the, uh, the current issue is, solves both the, the psychological and, you know, the, the tactical objectives. So do you, do you see that uh, manifesting itself in, in more signage in these common areas, uh, not, you know, not beyond, beyond what's now done in stairwells for, for egress, but mm-hmm. in common areas that are addressing, you know, either reminding them of, of the procedures and practices that are being, uh, you know, enacted by the, you know, their employer or the building owner or what have you, uh, so that they just, oh, there's always a backdrop of that positive communication to them. Absolutely. And and this goes back to what we spoke about earlier is part of the tactical procedure is putting in visual cues and graphic graphic posters and guidelines to show people what is the current health and safety etiquette. And this is not just a practical implementation. This is doing so so that people know that psychologically they, they feel that the space is thought out, is well thought out, it's been cleaned, that they are putting in regulations to make sure everybody is doing everything they can to you know, practice safe distancing or hand washing and sanitation practice. So it, it really is, it's practical and it's psychological. And a lot of uh, public spaces right now, workplaces, retailers, you know, museums, whatnot, is having these visual cues out there, um, not only as a way to inform um, best practice, but to also give that sense of um, that sense of security, knowing that things are being done and 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 uh, best practices are uh, being implemented in this space. So may you you had mentioned before about, common sense. And that's obviously something that is obviously lacking in great quantity today. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just one of those things that, you know, whoever can figure out how to teach common sense will make a trillion dollars. <laughs> that's, that should be a college major. <laughs> They'd be happy if they tried teaching it in grammar school, but, <laughs> you know, just be able to teach it. So, and along those lines, you have to be getting requests. We're not asking for specifics, but we're, you know, we've got to be getting requests from clients that you just realize they're just not effective. It's not something that's going to serve a great purpose. That's not going to have a good tactical purpose, but it's going to wind up making somebody feel really good. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you seeing in that, in that area? Well... You know, we're really running the gamut here. We have uh, all sh- shapes, sizes, personalities in the organization, and the diversity of that is really what makes you know our economy so wonderful as well. So, part of the discovery process that we talked about before, before we even get into the design development, is understanding who the clients are what they do, how they utilize their space, um, and what their needs are, and delivering a design that reflects those needs. So we start off by by really getting a a deep understanding of, you know, getting down to the DNA, um, if you will, to each organization so that when we do design the space, that it's not, we're not molding them into a particular space planning or particular setup, or more so we are allowing their behaviors to drive the design. 
Yeah, but and, no, I, I, mm-hmm. I get that, and I, and I think in the next, and, and I definitely want to get into what the planning process actually is going to be, the legitimate planning process is going to be. But I'm, what I'm thinking of here is we're seeing things like certain types of technology that want to be deployed. You know, there were, there were certain camera systems that, you know, for thermal imaging that just did not work. Mm. That weren't it just wasn't going to fit in in the application, and there were clients that were insisting that you know no we need to have this we got to have it, and they came up with it. Are you running across things where clients are insisting that you come up with something, either a technique or a process that you know is not going to work or that you're really not sold on? Or do you avoid that from the very beginning? Do you do you avoid that minefield from the from the planning <laughs> process? Absolutely. There will always be there will always be requests that doesn't make sense or is not a good decision. And I think to be to be responsible is to gauge: is this a project that I want to take on? And if I do, my job is to conduct the research and to lay out the best options for the clients and to only implement plans that are going to be safe, that are certifiable, and that's not going to uh, hurt anyone at the end, whether it's the client's business or my business. Um, So that's taking on less risk. But at the same time, I also want to respect the needs of the clients and the diversity and and really understanding why they're asking for this before we shut it down. Well, I Is think it because certain clientele, they they might have, you know, they might have a demographic that wants to see a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things put in place, a lot of implementations that may not make any sense while we are not going to do it, but I want to first understand that. Um, and then you have to you have to help the clients understand that, you know, this is not that this is not going to be, you know, really certifiable. This is not, you know, going to help with life safety and health within this space. So really, you know, understanding it, but you don't ever want to, encourage any kind of implementation that is not going to be beneficial for the end users. Well, clearly you you have to be watchful of of something that would go as far as actually violating a building code. You got to dig your heels in on that. But as far as the right. others, it's just a matter right. of, of education as to where it's a, a point of diminishing return or just an outright waste of you know, waste right. of money. So you have to educate and you have to guide the clients through through this and really only source items that are scientifically backed. Right. Well, that does position us for the next session, which will be getting into the planning. But before we do that, I will uh, remind our listeners that you are listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and Sal Lafrari. We invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or more one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or would like us to or would like to consult with us, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. So the third segment is what's needed to plan. Can you walk us through uh, the planning process? Sure. So when we first start a project with a client, um, whether they're moving into a new space or um, it's an existing space, is first we have to come up with a systematic plan. And the first and foremost is going through the discovery sessions, which includes client interviews at all levels within the organization. We uh, start with Uh, speaking with the uh, business leaders, C-suite levels, executive managers to everybody within the organization from top to bottom. And that is how we understand who the clients are and how much space they're going to need to their daily workflow and behavior within the environment. And from there, we formulate a plan 
that uh, really a program that is appropriate to what their needs are. And the really core of this is getting a good understanding of an organization's culture. Because today we have companies that really are, you know, their, their real marketing angle is their culture. And we today live in a purpose-driven economy. You know, in the year 2020, 50%, even a little over than 50% of the workforce are made up of the millennial generation, you know, people born between 1980 and and 2000 in that range. And this is a a generation that is, they're digital natives and um, have a very different way of working. So understanding who makes up the organization. Is this a, a white shoe law firm where the you know, core of the team are still baby boomers who are used to having that corner office. And in their mind, the corner office is something, a pride that they worked their entire uh, career for um, and really is a status symbol. And so then, you know, on the other spectrum, you have younger companies, tech startups, whatnot, who, you know, see it differently as if you could work remotely or work off your laptop, you know, at a coffee shop and have mobility that is more important and more of a status symbol than a corner office. So really understanding who they are, how they're going to use the space and then come up with a program and a a space plan for that. And then um, from there, design the concept and develop going forward. How much of an involvement do you wind up having with the security teams with because at some point there's got to be some conflict between what a, what a tenant might want, you know, if you're in a multi-tenant building, what a tenant might want and the security team, or it may even be in a regular facility, you know, one a single tenant um, owns a facility and uh, they have their own security and, and then you're coming in and you, you want to talk about, you know, the way people are going to get into the building or, you know, how to the use of the elevators or whatever. What's your experience? What have what are the things that you've gone through dealing with security? I mean, I understand you talk to everybody from like the C level all the way down to the employees, but mm-hmm. are you running into specific issues with security? Sure, we do. And and security is definitely a big component of how we uh how we develop the circulation paths to the space planning. There are, you know, certain departments that you know, may need more privacy than others. So that's, you know, where the security comes in. And a lot of times we start by interviewing the HR department and understanding how each business unit uh, work, how much privacy they need. And from there, that will inform our space planning um, in terms of adjacency studies. So really it's about understanding level of privacy and access uh, and that's, you know, that that's an, a very important part of the initial uh, planning phase. Well, May, we really uh, we really appreciate your uh, perspective here. Uh, we know the the power that our architects exercise over over owners. Uh, I've witnessed that many, many times. It's like, you know, you have a number of stakeholders that will be making their recommendations. But, you know, none of us carry the weight of the uh, of the architects with the, you know, with the owners. So you're in a. <laughs> a very influential position. How can our listeners contact you? So you can find me on LinkedIn, um, May Fan. You know, find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to happy to connect with anyone who wants to talk more about how to uh, leverage their, their space and, you know, or even talk about design ideas that is aligned with their, uh, their business trajectory. Um, you could also email me directly at May, M-A-Y uh, underscore fan. That's Foxtrot Alpha November at me.com. M-E. So May underscore fan at me.com. Well, very good. Thank you. Uh, you have been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and Sal LaFrary. We ask you to subscribe to this show and like us on your social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you are interested in having one or both of us speak, at an upcoming event or would like to consult with us, please go to the web page at theriskadvisor.com to set that up. 
Also, if you know someone that would make a great guest, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com and make your suggestion. Remember, you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform, YouTube, and of course, stream it at theriskadvisor.com. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you tune in again next week.